So in this series, Down Under, we are traveling through five different areas of Australia, five different mindsets with five different beautiful beings. And tonight in our series, we are getting to meet the legendary storyteller and communicator of all sorts of history, Miss Jane Ferrari. And Jane's gonna join us in just a few moments, but let's just say she's super badass. Don't forget to breathe because you're gonna be holding your breath, waiting for the next statement that she's uh, going to make. And Jane um, is going to give us a little bit of insight, not only about herself, but about South Australia and the Barossa Valley. So sit back, relax, and I'll see you in just a moment. Hi everybody, welcome to Core Body Mind. My name is Kat Thomas and I have just the distinct pleasure and honor, yes, and excitement today to introduce somebody that impacted me um, and has impacted a lot of humans on this planet. So uh, get comfy, grab the popcorn, grab some s'mores. Um, we're gonna take a little journey together and I think it's gonna be unlike anything that you've ever been involved in unless you've actually met this, this beautiful human. So we're gonna sit around the proverbial campfire together and we're gonna find out how wine is just one part of Miss Jane Ferrari's story. Um, most recently, the brand ambassador for Yolumba Wines um, in Australia, because if you didn't know, that's where we are right now. Uh, but Jane has influenced a lot of different avenues and um, aspects uh, for Australia. Um, she is also mentioned of herself, I'm pretty sure this was a quote about yourself. Uh, it's kind of like brown corduroy pants. If you hang around long enough, you become trendy all over again. I love that. Uh, that's, that's me. Yeah, yeah. And they're comfy and fabulous. Um, but let's do a quick rundown of some, just a few of her top hits. So yes, brand ambassador for the oldest winery in Australia that's still running, uh, 170 years old, um, in Barossa called Yalumba. Uh, you have been a champion for their viticulture, viniculture, the people, the land, the pride of the winery itself. And um, you are the best communicator. I think you're the only one that has that title or had that title in the wine world. Um, You've worked with a lot of great legends, but we're gonna talk about some of the top three. Robert O'Callaghan with Rockford Winery. For all those nerds out there, study that one. John Glatzer, uh, formerly Wolf Glass. And then most recently, of course, Robert Hall Smith, who is the proprietor and CEO of the Yalumba Legacy. In 2004, you received the Wyndham Hill Smith Award uh, as a recognition for your contributions to Yolumba, which you've been with them since 1987. 2012, you were the recipient of Wine Communicator of the Year. That's so badass sounding. Um, I just love that. And that is for education and global promotion of all Australian wines. Um, 2013, you have two great things. Uh, you were dubbed a Baron of Barossa. So this used to be like just for the boys, rocked that title. Um, and this is offered to people that have really made an outstanding contribution also to the Barossa and their uh, culture and wine. And then also named signatory for Yolumba for the signature Cabernet Sauvignon and Shiraz. So that is just a tidbit because everybody that knows me knows I like to talk, but this is a, a storyteller that we have and I'm so excited. So you might wanna like, Catch your breath now, take a deep breath in because you're going to hold it for a few moments every time she starts talking. You're a good woman. Ice skates or roller skates? Well, I'm a big girl, so a bit wobbly on both, um, but I'd say roller skates. What is your favorite lettuce? Oh, iceberg. I'm old school. Oh my gosh, that's mine. Everybody makes fun of me it. for it. It's the best one. Um, fruit or cream pies? Oh, cream pies. I don't even have to hesitate. I <laughs> went to, no, I, I went to, oh gosh, the best icebox pie in America. And they asked me out the back, this tiny little diner up um, Louisiana, uh, 
up where Elvis started, he, Louisiana Hayride, Strawn's Eat Shop, the best huh. icebox pie in America, and they took me out the back and let me help make one. Yep, no, cream pie. Nice. Um, <laughs> if you were a color, how would others see you? I like to think if I was a color, I'd be dark blue and uh, something with a bit of depth, yeah. So the Japanese have a word to describe the daily habits and, and the practice of those daily habits to achieve contentment, happiness, it's your devotion. They, they use the word soon. What are certain soons or daily practices that you do to achieve your own happiness every day? I've been a night owl. I'm a bit of a morning person, so uh, because I've been fortunate to travel extensively, I always like to get, as soon as I wake up, I like to throw some clothes on, get outside, and just make sure that I'm there. That first thing in the morning thing, just make sure I'm there because um, I'm a bit of a fan of uh, being above ground. So that's that's one thing. So wherever I am in the world, that first thing in the morning when generally it's reasonably still quiet, sort of five, six in the morning, and no one's really messed up your day yet. That, that's, that's a nice moment. That is that's, something, that's something I do regularly. Oh, that's something I do every day. I love um, it. That's a good yeah. lesson too. Mm. What are, say, like two words that you have found and I'll use American since I am one uh, that has made you giggle when they say it with confidence and it's really wrong. <laughs> I, I think it goes back to just the basic greeting that you get in Australia, that g'day thing. <laughs> and I see America, that looks like they've been practicing it. <laughs> and they'll go, good day, mate. And it's like, oh, no, 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 no. It's... Um, it's, I think it comes from years and years of people being in the outback in the early days and there's just multitudes of flies. So they, they tend to talk without opening their mouth. So it's just kind of like, g'day, g'day, you gone. And that's it. It's just, it's, it's quite funny to see Americans go, g'day. <laughs> it's like, no, 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 no. It's from the outback um, steakhouse commercials. I'm sure that's the only yeah. way that they have that. Yeah. Well, plus the fact that I've never seen a blooming onion anywhere in my world in Australia, <laughs> ever, ever. Um, there's a, a place up on the Sunshine Coast up in Queensland called Maloolaba. And that's a good one. If you ever see any of the Americans visiting the Gold Coast or the Sunshine Coast, and it's, it'll be like, Moolaloolaba. <laughs> no, nah, that place there, you know, on the beach. <laughs> that's quite funny. Yeah, that, that, that place there. <laughs> Yeah. Um, if you had to pick your favorite winemaking region in the world and we'll take Australia out of the mix, where would it be? Mm -hmm. Um, I've got a pretty, I've got a pretty sweet tooth and always have done. And in my winemaking class, I was the youngest in my class going through Roseworthy and, um, the boys, uh, bought this thing called, uh, Kudit to, to dinner one night. And I loved it. It was really sweet and luscious. And that was my introduction to Saturn. That was Kute. Huh. And uh, so I'd say if I had to pick a region, it would be Saturn. Too. How, how about a favorite landmark or natural habitat that no matter if you ever get to go back, you feel like you can get there with just the thought of it? Um, I've always uh, big Elvis fan. I've always been a fan of uh, American roots music and the blues. And because I traveled extensive to Amer extensively to America over many years, I was really for I've been really fortunate um, to be able to jump in a rental car and explore the Mississippi Delta. So I'm very comfortable flying into Memphis. I'm very comfortable jumping in a car and an hour and a half later being five miles south of Clarksdale at the Shack Up Inn um, and getting ready on a Wednesday night to go to Red's Duke joint in, in the wrong side of the tracks in Clarksdale. So, you know, I don't mind driving. And in, in Australia, it's funny, you don't realise that when, you, when you're in Australia, you talk to someone and say, 
how far is it from Adelaide to Melbourne? And you say, oh, it's about a 10 and a half hour drive. And, and you just don't, because of the distances, the tyranny of distance in this country, you just don't seem to mind that sort of driving. So jumping in a rental car in Memphis and heading down, for Miss, down through Mississippi is no big deal, you know. It's, so because you've got a car, your country's built for it and you just can go exploring. And as long as you've got a, a healthy dose of respect, um, you know, uh, packed in your suitcase, and I've been taken to places that, you know, it's like being, it's like being in a historical postcard one day and it's like being in a film clip the next. It's <laughs> been very good to me, your country. Good. That, that's very uh, comforting to hear, especially in these times right now. Hey, what, what's my favorite three things about America? Oh gosh. Um, I wouldn't be able to, I wouldn't be able to keep it to three things. I, I took a, um, a six day or six night ride on the uh, Alaskan Marine Highway uh, at the end in October last year uh, on the ferry. And uh, I ended up thinking I was a whale whisperer because every time I'd go outside and sit on a bollard in my eight layers of clothing, um, up would come this giant, huge behemoth of the deep and just sound and then go and, I'd be, and then there'd be a pot of dolphins or no I, i've um I, I i've traveled 48 states i've got two to go and uh no i like a lot about your country so who has been your biggest mentor motivator in the the profession that you are in um i'd have to say uh the, the, i'd have to say the three boys um, you don't realize at the time that there's three pivotal moments in your career. Um, the first one was when I was at Roseworthy College and we had to complete a vintage to, com to get our degree. And that was in 1983. And um, in the Barossa Valley, if you were a girl, pretty much your role in vintage at the winery was either in the laboratory, the Weybridge, the office or cellar door. Um, and I couldn't get a job for love nor money in the cellar uh, in a winery pretty much anywhere in the state actually and um, I just honestly I was 19 and just had no real idea those days about you know male dominant industries or anything really um, I'd never struck it you know and uh, um, I went to see my distillation teacher Bob Baker and he uh, rang John Glatzer, who'd just graduated from Roseworthy the year before and who uh, got the job with Wolf Glass um, in, in a very small fledgling operation, much smaller than it ended up, you know, becoming. And um, he rang John and said, listen, can you just give this kid a job sweeping floors, unloading road tankers, anything, just so she can get a degree? And I didn't know that had happened for, you know, for years later and um, those days, Wolf Glass had all his reds crushed at Peter Lehman's winery Masterson and, and all his whites crushed at Doug Lehman's winery Bazardo's down in Tanunda. So um, they had to have a lot of road tankers bringing the juice back to um, uh, Bill Yarra to finish fermentation. So uh, John Glatzer took me on for vintage and gave me a job unloading road tankers. And that lasted for about two weeks. And then he sent me down and I started um, looking after the pressing out at, at Masterson at Peter Lehman's and and then from there started looking after ferments on the ground and and do, ended up doing a complete vintage but if John hadn't taken that gamble on me back then I would never have had a career so John Glatzer is is really the first pivotal moment in my career and then um, okay I was working in bottling in Sydney and came back to South Australia because my mum was very ill and um, I uh, got a job at Yalumba in the bottling section, but couldn't get a job in the winemaking team. They were all very good at what they were doing quite young. So I took a big left turn and went to work at Rockford, which was this cult under the radar, almost unknown winery with Robert O'Callaghan at the helm and a mate of mine, Chris Ringland, who was in my class at winemaking school, who went on to become like winemaking superstar mm -hmm. uh, in Spain and Australia. And, um, and he said, hey, they're looking for someone in Cellador. 
And I said, oh, mate, I've never worked with a general public. I, I couldn't do that. And he said, just apply. So um, they used to send out a, a newsletter. Um, Rob used to write this gorgeous newsletter. And I wrote a handwritten pamphlet that was the newsletter. And I wrote this complete newsletter from Rockford to their customers. And the feature story was Rob got his first Ferrari. And um, I sent that in as my job application. And I got the job. And... Um, they were cult unknown. And in the three years I was there, 93, 94, 95, they went from cult unknown to cult, the hottest thing in the Australian wine industry. And we had people like you two and, and sports stars as our customers. And it was just the most extraordinary run. And, and Chris and Rob were making these amazing wines. And it was right at the, it was right, be, right after the, the vine pool, the South Australian vine pool, when um, to get over a, perceived grape glut, the South Australian government um, gave uh, growers the incentive to pay them to pull out their vines and, and not plant anything else, for, not plant any other grape vines for 10 years. So a lot of the old fortified grape varieties that had built the, Australia, the South Australian industry were pulled out, a lot of the sherry varieties, but also what was in, under threat was a lot of the old Grenache and Shiraz, Mataro um, that were around as well. And um, Rob had been, Rob O'Callaghan was one of those uh, winemakers that went around and said, no, I'll take your fruit for 10 years if you leave it in the ground. So I was there when all that was going on and, and it was just the most extraordinary place to be. And, and Robert was a, an extraordinary storyteller, yarn spinner, you know, one of the, one of the absolute custodians of the traditional um, uh, keys of, of our of our industry and you know 120 year old wood cr wooden crusher and um, salvaged the old Mintaro slate fermenters from the old Quartala winery in Clare you know he was just one of these guys that you, you you get a chance to meet once in a lifetime and and I was there for three years and for a year on the bench tasting bench I, I was working alongside of him so probably doing one of the most extraordinary apprenticeships ever you know so be Rob O'Callaghan and, and, and Rob Hill Smith when I went back to Yolumba to work for him um, in Salador and events, I got involved in their export side of the business and um, he gave me the opportunity to travel one year and you know just to let's see how it goes um, for a year job. So I threw myself into it and um, just had a lot of good fortune and made some great relationships and started I started looking at people and press consumers corporate folk um, restaurants retailers distributors as fortresses that could be built for the family business and if you had enough fortresses that were on your side working with you then you could build this great wall of your lumber across the world and it would keep everybody's mortgages safe so um, that ended up being a really good strategy and I ended up being in the job for 20 years you know I, the year I started, I was in New York, 9-11, and the year I finished, um, it was, uh, yeah, it was um, uh, the, um, uh, I was in London uh, when that man went mental on the, on the, on London Bridge. So it was kind of like the two bookends, you know? Wow. So, yeah, so those would be the three um, pivotal moments in my career and the three people that have had this extraordinary influence, but. I was also very lucky to be in a stellar uh, winemaking class uh, at Rosewoody College that had people like Chris Ringland and, and Rob Gibson and uh, Rolfie Binder and Mike Brykovich from Kumia River in, in New Zealand and Martin Shaw from Shaw and Smith and Roger Harbord and Peter Barry from Clare. And I was just in, and I was the youngest in the class. So I was kind of like had all these big brothers and, you know, they've, they've just always been there. So I've just been really fortunate, you know? Yeah, that's right. a rock star class right there. Sorry, long answer to a short question, really. No, 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 oh, no. I drew noon down in, um, <laughs> down in Southern Vales. Uh, Brendan Darvanese went on to become a member of parliament in Queensland. Yeah, it was pretty stellar year, you know? It was Rosie Butler from New Zealand, she was, there was two, two girls in the class, so. I was gonna mm. say, it, it sounded like it was all males, but there were two, two women? There's, yeah, two of us, Rosie was from, uh, from New Zealand, she already was in the wine industry, and, um, and uh, 
she uh, she went back and married married a geologist and lived happily ever after in the wine industry and uh, uh so with all of that goodness that you you had your big brothers and and all of that what has been the most challenging experience professionally that you've had so far um i think it would be once um i really got into the traveling role representing yolumba internationally and domestically um you realize uh, how much responsibility you've got um because um a circuit of events is put together um by distributors by people in the trade by sales reps you know and and you know you you come to town and and if you deliver if you do that right then you make immediate sales you make ambassadors for your brand and you build um solid foundations for business ongoing not just for your house but for your region and for your country and and that was something that really didn't land on me for a couple of years that uh, and we travel very well as a as a group here in the Barossa you know if we have the ethos that if the Barossa does well everyone in the Barossa does well and you don't realize that that's quite unique until you actually start traveling quite a bit and you realize that there's a lot of wine regions of the world in France or Germany or Italy that 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 don't do combined tastings you know and so um you know that was something that was really important and i think the most difficult thing in my career has been to make sure that i had a 100% strike rate every event that was planned you know was delivered you know and and that's really um how i looked at things because you know when you're working for a family owned business you, you just can't afford to make any mistakes rob hillsmith who owns your lumber one one evening at an event it was a big picnic massive picnic for vintage festival was the event that the winery was putting on and um we were there about 6 o'clock in the evening and everything was set to go and there was just myself and rob standing there having you know just having a last minute checklist and he said to me you know ferrari he said really we're in the business of agricultural entertainment and i never forgot that and i took that with me on the road so because there's only so many times you can go to the same place to the same corporate tasting or wine dinner and say well this is the next vintage of the wine you saw last year so besides talking about the wines i started bringing to life a lot of the characters of the of the the family and the region and and also the history um that i find fascinating and the way that things keep coming around all the time you know there's nothing truer said than that line in battlestar galactica where they say what has happened before will happen again you know it's like covid this too will pass it's one of those things so i used to start and and i'm really interested where i was traveling so i'd do a bit of research if i was going to um des moines iowa you mm-hmm. know and i'd know that it was the capital of pork and corn country and and i really got involved and because i got involved it it seemed like people wanted to do wanted to show you their world which is how i ended up on a turkey shoot in des moines isle in iowa but in the badlands of iowa but that, and that's a whole another experience to being camouflaged from top to toe but that's another story um so i think that was the most difficult thing was to keep delivering at that level to keep being that uh entertaining informative but entertaining person that came to town and and built those fortresses and consolidated those fortresses and looked after you know the reps and dropped fairy dust on people when they needed it you know because people are doing hard yards at the coal face in 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 the wine industry doesn't matter if you're a som or a sales person or the folk in charge of getting the wine out of the warehouse to the right spot at the right time you know so sometimes you just got to learn to drop a bit of fairy dust you know when you come to town and sometimes that's a a stop off at dunkin donuts to buy someone a thermos and a 20 dollar voucher to buy as many donuts as they can eat in a week and, and sometimes it's hey you know when we finish tonight we finish at 11 o'clock tonight and we're in los angeles and you know muzzo and franks on hollywood boulevard opened in 1928 and the guys behind the the bar there were there when they opened let's go there and and let's this is our last night in america let's go there and have a cosmopolitan you know and let's pretend we're you know let's pretend it's 90 years ago and it's the golden age of hollywood and and 
we end up a couple of zillionaires with us and bar hopping in Hollywood Boulevard and ending up at Pink's Hot Dogs at three o'clock in the morning before flying out the next day. And that's the good stuff. So that was my most, the biggest challenge was to be able to come to town and deliver for, for my house. Years. For and, my and house and for my region and for my country, you know? Yeah. And, and mm. you know, that is something that is, you know, a hospitality sort of gift that not everybody can flow with that easily. But yes, it does take a lot of work and it takes a lot of energy on your part. Um, so again, another thank you for being that person because, you know, it's kind of like when a, a sales rep would come into the restaurant and they're trying to have me taste something that's already on my wine list on the BTG and they didn't even know it. Mm. You know, it's, it's those little tiny things that show that you actually are involved and you're invested, not just because you want to make the, the mortgage payments or mm. you, know, you are doing it because that's a part of who you are. It's, it's, it's a part of your being. So, and you do it without seemingly not, you know, it looks like you're having a great time doing it. So that's a bonus, I would think. <laughs> Um, so let's, before we kind of get into a lot of the fun things that you get to do, like the turkeys and camouflage and all this other stuff that people invite you to do, let's, let's talk about the Barossa Valley because I wanted to show people different areas of Australia, not just what people expect or have thought the, the region produces, um, you know, hopefully whoever is watching this um maybe find something new and exciting out by hearing what you have to say about it so i'm gonna let you take it <laughs> I, th I think um it's funny you know sometimes you don't realize that uh you know you know what you know um i think the best thing about the barossa for me has been to go back into the history of the place and you know, you, you talk about people making new and exciting discoveries. One of the best discoveries that I've been able to take, not only to people in the international arena, but even to people in Australia, is this story of the origins of our industry that most folks, you know, are unaware of. And by um, w when Australia was colonised, and let's not get too far into that can of worms because that's a situation that we're still dealing with in this country and, and not particularly well. Um, but when we were colonized by the English um, as a penal colony um, and everything nasty that went with that, it wasn't terribly long until Australia turned into this extraordinary agricultural powerhouse for the British Empire. And as we got into that and we got into the Industrial Revolution in, in, in England, they realized, the powers that be in England realized that um, not only were we an agricultural powerhouse, but everywhere that you stuck a, a shovel in the ground, you found something valuable. Whether it was gold, we had a gold rush um, uh, in Victoria, but it was coal and there was all this coal in New South Wales. So they sent out a Scottish mining engineer um, in uh, 1832 to open up the coal fields of New South Wales. And lucky for us in the wine industry that his son who just finished viticulture um, came out with him. Well, the whole family emigrated actually. And he realized that Australia had great potential. Well, the parts of New South Wales that he saw had great potential for grapes and wine. So he went straight back to the old world um, of France, Portugal, and Spain. And he proceeded to collect five or 600 varieties of grapes. And he kept a really detailed diary while he was doing that. And he systematically bought those grapes back into Australia in sandboxes on penal ships and also on free settler ships. So he sets up this uh, grape repository in New South Wales and starts a, a school of enology and viticulture. And long story short, it goes well until he decides he wants to be a politician and in Australia couldn't get a gig. So he goes to New Zealand and becomes quite pivotal in something called the Treaty of Waitangi. But that, res that repository of grapevines goes to the Sydney Botanic Gardens which then gets transferred down to the Adelaide Botanic Gardens where South Australia gets opened up. And what we have there that arrives in South Australia, also the MacArthur family who bought Merino sheep to Australia imported grapevines as well. And they imported them 
before phylloxera devastated the European arena in the late 1800s. So today is today, without going into a great deal of interesting history, today is today in Australia, in regions like the Barossa, like McLaren Vale, like Clare, uh, over in the Goulburn Valley, up in the Hunter Valley, we've got these grapevines that are over 120 years old on their own roots. So you've got this extraordinary viticultural treasure trove that, ex that only exists in Australia of these varieties like Grenache, Shiraz, Mataro, Riesling, um, Tariga, Tintacao, Pedro. And this is this most extraordinary palette that we get to work with as winemakers and grape growers. And it's, the, it's this kind of extraordinary thing that we have that a lot of folks don't even know about. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when we're talking about, um, when I was taking Yolumba's Cayley Cabernet Shiraz combination, which is old Australian claret, when I'm taking that to um, uh, um, the Mandarin Oriental in London to uh, Daniel Ballou's Cafe Ballou casual operation, and I'm faced with 20 seated um, sommeliers, all male, English, Belgian, French, Italian, and uh, German. And I'm telling this story that when you, you know, a young lad said, I was showing them the, the Kaylee and, and, and he said, but most of my drinkers are Bordeaux drinkers, so why would they like this wine? And I'm like, well, because the Cabernet goes straight back to Bordeaux. The Shiraz goes straight back to uh, Hermitage. Back in the day, in Busby's diary, he says, when I'm talking to one of the bankers and owners of uh, Shiraz from the Hill of Hermitage, he says, well, we send all our best Shiraz to Bordeaux to mix with their Cabernet, and this is 1833. So I said, this Cabernet in this wine goes straight back to, um, to Bordeaux, the Shiraz is planted in 1901. The Federation of Australia goes straight back to Hermitage. Back in the day, before Appalachian was handed down in Bordeaux, they used to mix Shiraz and Cabernet. That was what they did because they were complementary. So all of those great uh, wines are, are, are a mixture of Cabernet and Shiraz, which is exactly what we're doing today. And um, Shadow Palmer put out a tribute wine um, where they made a tribute to the pre-Appalachian uh, styles. They couldn't put their name on it because it was outside Appalachian, but it was $600 a bottle and sold out overnight. Yep. So I said, technically speaking, we're doing what Bordeaux used to do and what they would do if they could do, but they can't. And the, the Sorellias looked at me and they said, why don't we know this story? And I said, that's a really good question. <laughs> why don't we tell that story? So I think that's probably... Um, the best thing about the Barossa, we have this extraordinary thing to work with. And we have about 13 um, unofficial sub-regions to our, our Barossa region, which encompasses the valley floor, the Barossa Valley floor and the Eden Valley high country, um, different by about three, uh, about three weeks ripening with the cooler evenings up in the high country. And we have this extraordinary 13 uh, uh, sub-regions by soil and microclimate that define themselves and we're working with things that are from this viticultural treasure trove and you know that's that's where that's where in my opinion the Barossa story starts under the ground what's coming up yeah, yeah. now are, are you a proponent of uh, those sub-regions becoming official oh look I would love to see it because uh, why we don't talk more about terroir in this country, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Because that definitely exists. The expression, I mean, Barossa is known worldwide for Shiraz, but there's so many expressions of Shiraz within the region, you know? Kunawara is known for Cabernet. There's so many expressions of Cabernet within Kunawara. McLaren Vale and the Barossa are known for Grenache. Um, you know, it's always been a bit of a poor relation to Shiraz, but Grenache uh, from some of these regions, I would challenge some of the Pinot makers, you know, some of them are, are just extraordinary. Um, Riesling, the expressions of Riesling that vary here in our Eden Valley Riesling and then an hour and a half up the road, 
the, varia the expression is different for the water vial Rieslings, but within the water vial Rieslings, there's variation. So I, I, I would love to see us talk a little bit more about uh, terroir, and I'd love to see a little bit more of that delineation of those uh, sub -regions. Mostly everybody considered Australia wines to be all one thing. They didn't even know what the grape was at, at a time. Everything was, this is an Australian wine. And um, I think now, especially with people getting to go and travel there with different groups, like Wines of Australia has been great. The Busby travel tours have been awesome mm. to kind of get the, the people that are trying to buy and sell the wines, get a glimpse of, oh, holy shit, this really is that different. And there are that many different expressions and getting those wines actually out of Australia into our hands, I think has opened up the consumer's eyes a little more. So I think it would be great to see some regional sort of focus on the label. So we, we kind of discussed a little bit about what's going on in the world and it's, it's chaotic and it's um, scary and it's intense. Um, but you know, I think what you, you did mention earlier about still, you know, that everyday habit that you have of going out and standing on the earth and, and rooting yourself down and being appreciative of being above the ground is a wonderful thing. Um, has there been any other effect of this pandemic to your professional um, lifestyle and have you adjusted greatly due to it? Oh, massively. Um, uh, I had actually uh, resigned from Yolumba in January and uh, I had a, an extraordinary year where I, I cherry picked some fantastic events in America, New Zealand and Australia and I was going to have a pretty leisurely year starting to wind down. And um, I was going to set myself up as a contractor, an independent contractor. And uh, fortunately, Yolumba uh, had already um, uh, put some, uh, some, some really interesting projects uh, aside for me. And um, I, I was going to ha have a pretty amazing year. And then literally in the space of three weeks, that just evaporated. Um, and I spent quite a bit of money. I spent my savings last year on a holiday, you know, where I went to Alaska and I went to the Whiskey Island of Isla in Scotland. Um, so I was kind of in a pretty dire spot, um, I'll be honest with you. Um, but I'm really fortunate because um, I, I have a really lovely block of land up in the, up in, uh, the Brossa Valley. Um, and I'd, I'd paid, <clears throat> I'd paid it out a couple of years ago, so I didn't have a mortgage. So I thought, oh, well, time to start planting vegetables, get some chooks, um, and, uh, you know, um, I'll start writing up all those stories that I always wanted to write, and I'll put them on a website, and I'll have a uh, subscription. And that's how I'll make a, a, enough money to pay the, uh, pay the payments on my car and, and uh, you know, make every and pay the bills and uh that's kind of where i started and then um uh and i had a couple of contracts for your lumber and retail went pretty well in australia on premise went 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 really was was restricted badly at the start but there's been some pretty amazing success stories where restaurants have actually swung straight across to take out with single bottle sales as well Mm -hmm. um, but largely, it was the retail sector that kept wine flowing um, in, in this part of the world. Um, and then um, word got around that, uh, that I, I'd, I'd, you know, resigned and was, you know, available. And <clears throat> as Chris Ringland said, I'm, I'm like Switzerland, I'm neutral now. So um, whatever anyone came up with, I said yes. So I ended up teaching uh, brand ambassador skills and strategies in one direction writing wine notes uh, for websites in another direction, new releases. Um, I uh, started a Zoomy wine chat show with a, a lass who said, do you want to have a chat? I'm like, yep. Now we're in season two of What Was I Drinking? And we've got John and Tim DeVal this week. I mean, we've got all the stellar, all the stellar oh. talent. Um, and then uh, uh, um, a couple of other uh, wine labels, uh, Jim Barry, uh, wanted some work done and a lovely little um, uh, sheep 
but not little, a lovely uh, sheep breeding, meat uh, sheep breeding property out the back of Angus and Hutton Vale, um, said to me, listen, you know, come and have a chat. And it turns out they've got this extraordinary story where um, they planted uh, Mount Edelston in 1912. And then because uh, the chap who was running the family business at the time to the Angus family got ill, they sold the vineyard to their neighbor, which happened to be the Henschke family, who went on to take it to great heights. But meanwhile, back at Hutton Vale, they've taken a whole dose of cuttings and planted their own eight acre vineyard. So they're making Shiraz in the back box. And that's um, beautiful property. Oh my God. And that beautiful property. And so what we've done is we've platted the sheep here and the wine making year. And so now we've got these little moments like Budburst Best Pasture, where we're doing little events and showing that world to the world. So, um, you know, I've been really fortunate and, and, and now they're putting a boutique hotel, 138 rooms in Adelaide, in the Adelaide Oval, which is an iconic cricket sporting, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ironic, iconic sports arena for, for Australia. It's um, where they've played uh, great cricket for over a hundred years. And Sir Donald Bradman, that was his home uh, pitch. And it'd be, like, it'd be like the story of Babe Ruth playing at Yankee Stadium. Mm -hmm. Sir Donald Bradman played at Adelaide Oval and they've put this uh, 138 room hotel into the confines of the, of the Oval. And there's a little puppy dog that lives in the, um, uh, foyer and they've got a restaurant that they're going to open called Five Regions because we have five wine regions in South Australia Coonawarra, Clare, um, McLaren Vale, Adelaide Hills and Barossa. So for two months of the year that um, restaurant is going to have the wine and food personality of that region with feature, um, feature events and flights and so I've just um, been taken on as a consultant to help curate that personality and host some of the events and um, be a bit of an ambassador for the place. So I'm pretty excited. And so out of the ashes, as they say, you know, out of the ashes of a rubbish year, um, you know, and, and meanwhile, I've got uh, broad beans coming in by the pound. The broccoli's just finished. I got, I'm making eight egg frittatas once a week from the chooks and uh, I'm, I'm making double batches of honey crackles and, and uh, you know, spending a lot more time with people I actually know. It's, it's been tremendous. It's been, it's a relief and it's really um, not too bad now. Um, it's, uh, you know, but I'm extremely thankful. Uh, for the work that's coming my way, it's it's uh, you know, um, it's it's tough for a lot of folks, and I'm I'm very mindful. So I don't go anywhere without something under my arm, you know, whether it's honey crackles or frittata or you know a bag of broad beans um, or half a dozen eggs, you know, it's 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 little things, but it makes a lot of difference. It's fairy dust, you know. Yes, that fairy dust. Um, now your your family is of Italian heritage, like Southern Italy, correct? Or is it? No, my father, yeah, my father's from Liguria, from a little town called Lerici. And my mum uh, was from Adelaide. So okay. um, yeah, I grew up in an Italian Australian household. Yep. Now, how is that? Oh, it's pretty interesting when you got salami sandwiches at school <laughs> in Alice Springs, uh, but it was, uh, <laughs> It, there was a fairly big Italian community in Alice Springs. Um, I mean, there still is. So, um, can you just yeah, explain guess, where that is for people who might? Oh, not. Alice Springs is. If you put a map of Australia, superimpose it over a map of America, Alice Springs is roughly um, where Des Moines, Iowa, is. Right in the. Oh no, it's a bit lower than that actually. Be roughly where um, probably Dallas, Texas. Okay. Roughly in roughly in the middle of the country and um, it's about um, four, uh, 200 miles from Uluru uh, which is also ha used to be known as Ayers Rock so it's right in the center of the country they call it the red center the 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 a lot of the dirt around there is like uh, like a bright red sand 
um, and it's there's a range of um, uh, there's a, a range of hills there, not so much mountains but hills uh, called the McDonald Ranges, but McDonald Ranges, but um, just right where Alice Springs is, um, and there's a whole series of water water courses through there, um, and uh, the uh, Aboriginal folk uh, call call that area Yipperinya country because it's like uh, caterpillar country. So when you're up in a plain, or when you're at different points around uh, the area, the McDonald's look like giant caterpillars, actually. So they call it Yipperinya country. So I will not try and repeat that word just yet. Sorry? I'll try to repeat that word at another time. <laughs> there were, the local uh, the local uh, shopping centre is called Yeparinya, so it's not hard to not hard to get around. But that's um it's uh, Albert Namajira country, um and uh, he is a very famous uh, Aboriginal painter, watercolours. So it's um yeah it's beautiful country, yeah. Big wide open. So. What else, if you're, you know, I, I think I've kept you for so, so much longer than, than uh, I should have been allowed to, but you're just fascinating and, and I'm catching my breath now because I've been holding it this whole time. Um, what is something else that you would want to share? And I know since you are a communicator and a storyteller and, you know, I've had the, the actual fortune of listening to you by a real campfire, but What's something that you'd want to share with everybody here about yourself, about Jane Ferrari? Um, Besides that you'd be royal deep blue. <laughs> <laughs> Probably, um, I think uh, just, if anything, I'm more than the wine fascinated by the history now. Um, I remember going to a, uh, uh, an interview with uh, who I thought was a journalist in Dublin, in Ireland. And I had to get all dressed up because the, um, the interview was at a, an old club on St. Stephen's Green, which if you've ever been to Dublin, it's right in the heart of the city. And um, not very far uh, to the sort of pubs area. And, uh, um, but it's, it's, it's St. Stephen's Green is, is the really big park, the central park of, uh, of Dublin anyway there's these lovely old clubs, um, gentlemen's clubs on there. And, and um, I had to meet him at this club and uh, it was Dr. So-and-so. So I thought he was a medical doctor. At any rate, I got there all dressed up and we sat down for lunch and um, I said, oh, I said, so, you know, Dr. So-and-so. And I never Google people beforehand. I've learned that. And um, I always, I'm always in for a free consult, you know, especially if they're, you know, back specialists. I've got a crook back. And I said, so, you know, what are you a doctor of, you know, just in case I can get a bit of a free consult? And he said, um, oh, no, he said, I'm a PhD doctor. And he turned out to be the number one investigative journalist for the equivalent in uh, Ireland of uh, PBS in America or the ABC or the BBC. And um, I'm like, oh, really? He goes, yeah, he said. And I said, oh, you might be interested then. And I started telling him about this intrepid traveler um, that was part of the family at Yolumba, the current um, uh, Robert Hillsmith. Uh, Robert and Sam are the two brothers that own Yolumba at the minute. And Robert and Sam's grandfather's elder brother was like the Indiana Jones horticulturalist of Yolumba. And um, he was sent away at the age of 29 to travel for two years, 1893, 1894, around the British Empire and America to get as much knowledge about winemaking, grape growing, um, fruit, because we had fruit orchards and a fruit canning business as well, and a jam making business. So he was sent on this two year um, fact finding tour uh, and to build business for the for the company. And he sent 30 to 50 page letters home every second day to his father. And those letters were lost until, 19, until 1999. And they were found when they swung the staircase round at Yolumba in the clock tower, big old building. And the historian Viv McKenna was given this box, boxes of, of letters. And they were, the, the, the family didn't even know they existed. 
And I read the five volumes and I used to tell stories about this guy wherever I was traveling. So if I was in London, I'd tell a story about Fred in London. If I was in Dublin, I'd tell a story about Fred Cayley Smith in, in Dublin because his letters are just gorgeous, you know, it's unbelievable. Anyway, we started talking about that and, and, and this guy, this journal, this uh, journalist stopped me dead. And he said, you know, he said, you, you, you're a, you're a charlatan. I said, excuse me. He said, he said, you're not a winemaker, wine person at all. I said, excuse me. He goes, you're a historian. And I was like, Oh, I he am. ended it nicely. And, That's a bad yeah. And then he proceeded to tell me about um, the project that he was working on. And uh, he, He'd, he'd been over to Berlin when the fall of the Berlin Wall was on. And he was over there ostensibly to, to cover the fall of the Berlin Wall. But in actual fact, he, had, he was there for a completely different reason. He was there because he'd been given a small but definite window of opportunity to talk to the East German authorities, let's just call it, um, to investigate the relationship between Ireland and Germany before the Second World War. Wow. And he was writing a book on that relationship. So we ended up talking a lot about, a little bit about wine and a lot about world history. And um, so that would be, if there was any like secret behind the scenes moment, it would be, you know, the, the, the history of it. And so when, when it comes to traveling your country, I've tried every time I go to your country I've, or any, any other country, I try and do a book or a play and, and live it. So I went, when I was working in, at, uh, in Georgia, I took my weekend in Savannah and did Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil huh. and had no idea that it was a true story and little old historical lady at the cemetery on a Sunday morning was telling me all sorts of stories and, and then I went from there. So yeah, it would be the try. I like to try and, and live the history where you can. So. Hmm. Awesome. Um, hmm. Well, I think that you make history. You know, I, I think it's fascinating as well. But I'm, you know, I know that it's a chore for some people to learn history about anywhere, um, even about their own self. But uh, I think you you make it enjoyable, approachable, and um, stimulating and, and it's a very visual textural almost experience when you're speaking about things oh, so thank you very much it's, it's very awesome. nice and hence all of your uh, accolades for being a communicator <laughs> and such and storyteller um before we end though if you had only 10 minutes and only one glass of wine what would that glass of wine be and who would you share it Oh, I don't really have to hesitate. Uh, when I was a kid on tour uh, at Rosemary College, my first ever wine tour, I'm 18 years old. Uh, we go to Babies of Bandara and we meet a winemaker called Harry James Tinson. Um, and he made some of the most phenomenal muskets and tokays fortified wines, which is what our industry was built on in the early days. And that was where I got for the first time that a bottle of wine can actually be a time capsule and is actually liquid history. And um, it would be a bottle of, uh, and he used to make the pick of the, the pick of the house musket in a, a dump fortified screw cap bottle, you know, $8, I think it was a bottle those days. And, um, and uh, now that, that sort of stuff is legendary. And it was uh, his. Yeah, his, a near, his, a, his name was Harry James Tinson, and the wine was HJT Musket from Bailey's of Bandara. And if I had to share it, um, I mean, you don't gosh. have to. <laughs> uh, if I had to share it, it'd be. And you know, I am actually. I do have actually the emotional depth of a rain puddle. Um, it would be with someone like um, Elvis or. Derek Jeter or, you know, yeah, someone like Elvis that. Elvis or Derek Jeter. All right. Or maybe, uh, you know, the the guys from Credence Clearwater Revival or maybe the guys from Cold Chisel, a band that used to play around the pubs when I was a kid. 
you know, all those legendary blokes that you never, ever get to really talk to, but, you know, always wanted. Yeah. And, and, you know, so that brings up, we, we didn't really hear you talk about yourself too much. You talked about everyone else, which is okay, because that's what you do. The job. That is that's the yes, job. You are. But um, yes, you also are a musician, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> Pretty bad when I got three chords, I think. <laughs> <laughs> that's three more than I do. So that's awesome. It's, you know, like I said, emotional depth of a rain puddle, really. I've just had a great gig with good material. We have the great fortune to have everything here from very small snowfields to tropical rainforest. And I just hope we're smart enough to keep some of that in the condition, you know, you know that it's in. Uh, um, you can't, you can't, I don't want to be controversial, but at the end of the day, you can't breathe uh, and eat stuff that you dig out of the ground or, you know, you got to, you got to keep some sort of balance. And we have some extraordinary uh, places and, and, and habitats in this country. And I, you know, from the Great Barrier Reef to the wilderness of Tasmania to the deserts of, of, of the Northern Territory and Western Australia. Um, and, you know, I've been to a place called Dolphin Beach, which is literally, you know, five hours drive from here in the bottom of the uh, York Peninsula. And I've seen dolphins surf in on the waves and the beach is a mile long. And if you're in any other part of the world, it'd probably be covered in beach umbrellas and, and stuff. And, and we've just got the most extraordinary places and I just hope we're smart enough to keep a few of them nice and tidy. I know the rest of the world's going to love this. And oh, I hope so. Well, they, they better, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> but uh, from, from myself, from uh, Summation Live, and um, I just want to say thank you. Uh, we thank you and we appreciate your time and energy. And I am going to wish you all of the best in all the things that are happening for you. I'm glad that the the breath is coming a little more with hope and, and a positive flow now. Um, and I hope it continues upwards for you. So. Hi friends, thank you again for joining us in the More Than Psalm Down Under series. So excited that you were able to share with us on this journey. My name is Kat Thomas with Core Body and Mind, and we are in collaboration with the Badass Crew over at Summation Live. So if you want to find out some more clues and how to be in the Down Under with us during this month, check out at Summation Live on Instagram or at Wine Goddess LV.